us to take the step that we need to take today to draw closer to you. It's in Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. It's a little better. It's a little better. Anybody play golf in here? Anybody? Any golfers? A few. Who tries to play golf? Let's put it that way. That's a little better, right? Uh, so confession for me is that I first started playing golf. I was probably 11 or 12 years old. And I started playing golf because I liked driving the golf cart. Anybody else say that? They just, that's, just, that's why I started playing golf. But I have a real big problem with my golf game. One is that I haven't played golf in a couple of years. Um, but number two is that I have what they call a wicked slice. Does anybody else have a slice when they play golf? Anybody just be willing to just, let's just have some therapy. Now, if you don't know what a slice is, let me just try to explain it to you. So a slice is that when you try to hit the ball straight, it goes way to the right if you're right-handed. Now, if you're left-handed and you're hitting left, it's going to go way to the left. But my, I have the, it's, it's, it's just like I can aim straight like for the camera back there, and I can wind up over in that corner, no problem at all. No problem. I can just do it. It's, it's not, and I've had guys, I've had coaches, I've had some really good golfers through, through the years that have tried to help me fix my slice when I play golf. And, and I can, occasionally I can hit the ball straight, um, but in trying to correct it, what I also do is I pull it way to the left as well. Anybody have that problem? So I'm all over the place. Now here's the problem though. Uh, if you play in a golf tournament, like a real golf tournament, now most of you don't play in a real golf tournament and actually follow all of the rules of golf. If that's you, would you just please raise your hand real quick? Like you don't follow all the rules of golf. Like three of you. The rest of you are lying. The rest of you that play golf are lying. So I played in a tournament, like a tournament where I had to count all of my strokes when I was in high school. I played on the golf team. Um, and I was the low man on the roster. They really shouldn't have let me play in a golf tournament. One of my buddies was, uh, he actually wound up going and playing golf in college, and he's one of the guys who through the years has tried to help me correct my slice. But I, it's just, it, it, it just shows up at the worst times. And, of course, when there's pressure like in a golf tournament, that, that's a time that it's going to show up. And so I was on a, a par five in one of the courses in Sea Pines. That was our home course. And I get up there on a par five, and sure enough, I mean, I'm off into the woods, way to the right. And I go in there, I try to find the ball. It's out of bounds. Now, if it's out of bounds, you have to go back from where you hit the ball and hit it again. So I had to walk all the way back to the tee box. I hit it again, sure enough, into the woods I go. And so I go and try to find it again, hoping it's not out of bounds. It's out of bounds. I have to walk back to the tee box and hit again. This goes on to where I finally finished the hole with an 18. Has anybody else ever gotten an 18 on a hole? Come on, just, just a little help. Thank you, those of you who admitted that. But, you know, that, that's one way to play golf. Now, there's another way to play golf. When I was growing up, my brother and I, we played golf with a guy named Mike. And I'm not going to say uh, Mike's last name because some of you probably know Mike. He was around this area for about 20 years. And uh, Mike, when we would go play golf, Mike kept an extra golf ball in his pocket. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? Because some of you are that guy. I may have changed the name to protect the innocent. Just saying, it could be you that I'm talking about. But Mike, he would get up there and he would, he would hit the ball. And before the ball even landed, before you even knew where it was going, if it was a bad shot, Mike would immediately put another ball down, step back up and hit another ball before you could even realize what he had done. And, and then you look at him and go, hey, did you count all of those strokes? And he finishes the nine and he's got like a 40. And you're going, dude, I think you had that on one hole because you kept just dropping the ball. He, but that's called, in golf, that's called a do-over. And you can't really legitimately have that when you play by all of the rules. Now, here's where this translates for us in our lives. For a lot of us, we're going through life and... We, we have a little hiccup along the way. There's something that happens and we fail to the point where we want a do-over. We want to pull the golf ball out of our pocket, drop it down while nobody's watching, and we want to take another swing at it in hopes that we can actually use that ball that we hit out there that went straight. We hope that nobody will pay any attention. We just want a do-over. We, we don't want to suffer the consequences of... The, the failure or the decision that we made, we just want to be able to do it over. But the truth is, 
that doesn't work for us in our life, does it? We're, we're not able to just have a do-over. We're not able to, to approach it and just decide that we, we, that wasn't good enough and so we want to start all over again. We have to deal with the consequences of our decisions and a lot of times we don't like those consequences. However, here's the thing. When you look at Scripture, what you realize is that the, the pages of Scripture are filled with people who failed miserably. And in the midst of the failure, what you realize is that God always uses fail, failure to accomplish something else in our lives. And so we need to get to the place where we look at our failure differently. We can look at it through the lens of Jesus and know that he is up to something more in our life. So if you have a copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to turn to John chapter 18. We're going to look at probably one of the most famous failures in all of the pages of Scripture this morning. John chapter 18, we're in our series called Forever After. And in this series, we're taking a look at the last few chapters of the Gospel of John and looking at how the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ forever impacts our forever after. And today we're going to look at it through that lens of failure. Through that lens of failure. And so John chapter 18 speaks to this. And, and we're going to look at Peter. But first, before we get to Peter, I want to show you just this big picture of something you can allow into your life that will make just a huge difference for you. So John 18, we're going to go 1 through 6 as we get started. Ready? Good. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine, the, uh, ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Now Judas also who was betraying him, knew the place. For Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. And he said to them, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with him. So when he said, this is John's recollection as he writes verse 6, but this is so cool. Uh, so when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now, this is what I want to show you. The first thing this morning has to do with the, realizing the glory of God and how it fits into your failures. The glory of God and how it fits into the failures. And here, here's what I mean by this. In John chapter 18... We've seen all of these great miracles of Jesus. We've heard all of the great teachings of Jesus. But what you see in John chapter 18 is just a little glimpse into the glory of Jesus. And here's what I mean. Just understand the context. Uh, Judas had betrayed Jesus, and so he shows up with all of these Roman soldiers uh, and, and whoever else is in that mix. I mean, we don't have any idea who all shows up here. But here's what we know. We know they brought, listen to what they brought, right? Verse 3, they brought lanterns and torches and weapons. Those three things. So they brought lanterns, torches, and weapons to the garden. So we, we know it's at night because they brought lanterns and torches. And they brought weapons. I don't know why they brought weapons exactly. I don't know if they were expecting the remaining 11 disciples of Jesus to bring about an uprising and they were going to just going to squash it right there. I don't have any idea why they felt like they had to bring weapons other than they just did. This this is probably just how they approached it. And Jesus was knew exactly what was going to happen and so he steps into this moment as they're approaching him in this garden. He steps into this moment, approaches them and says, "Who who are you looking for? Whom do you seek?" And they answer the question. They say, "We're looking for Jesus the Nazarene." And here's his answer. I am he. And in that moment, in that moment, there's just this little dose, this little bit of the glory of God jumps out of Jesus and knocks everybody over. This is, this is a lesser known piece for many of you. You've skipped right over verse, you've skipped right over verse 6 in this. So look, look at verse 6 again. So when he said to them, I am he, what's it say? It, he, they drew back and what? Fell to the ground. They drew back and fell to the ground. So all these, 
All these big, tough, macho guys. All these Roman soldiers. They've got their torches. They've got their lanterns. They've got their weapons. And they're ready to take Jesus. And he meets them. Who are you looking for? We're looking for Jesus the Nazarene. I am. Boop. He. And they fell back and fell to the ground. I know you, you don't seem enthralled by this. But this is a huge picture for all of us when you look in the pages of Scripture. Because this is one of those moments that Jesus is one. He's claiming to be God. That's the first thing. The second thing is, this is one of those moments where not only does Jesus claim to be God, but in his claiming to be God, God affirms his claim by the glory of God showing up in this moment as he uses a name of God to answer a question. And in that moment, the glory of God comes out of Jesus and knocks the people over. This is major. Why? Look at Exodus chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, turn to Exodus 3. And I want to, I want to show you where this comes from. Because this, this, this is, to me, this is a game changer in the life and ministry of Jesus. I mean, it's one thing for Jesus to, to claim to be God. It's one thing for Jesus to be able to teach the Word of God. It's one thing for Jesus even to be able to... Um, uh, do these miracles, but it's, it's another thing for Jesus to have the glory of God show up and knock people over. This is huge, and Exodus 3 is where we first encounter this, and so a little bit of context for Exodus 3. You remember the Israelites, God's they're in captivity in Egypt. So in Exodus chapter 3, we have God showing up to Moses to call him into service so that he can go into Egypt, go to the Israelites, and lead them out of captivity. And Moses has all kinds of questions. But one of the questions is, why is anybody going to listen to me? Why is anybody going to listen to any word that I am saying? And so God shows up to Moses and answers this question. So um, Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, ready? What is his name? What shall I say to them? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the, to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And then skip down to the, just the end of verse 15. This is my name forever. And this is my name memorial name to all generations so this this is no mistake in john chapter 18 if you go back there there's no mistake in this that jesus answered this question with intentionality he answered this question because he wanted to show them one more time as if all of the teaching wasn't enough, as all, all the miracles weren't enough, if the transfiguration wasn't enough, if the testimony of people wasn't enough, he is going to have the testimony of God affirm who he is. And so when he answers the question of whom do you seek, and they say Jesus the Nazarene, he says, I am he. And the glory of God comes out of Jesus in that moment and knocks people over. How does this translate for us in our life? Well, one of the ways is I believe for us, if we can get a glimpse of the glory of God, if we can get a glimpse of the glory of God in our life, it will radically change how we look at all of our circumstances. If we allow the glory of God to overwhelm our fears, if we will allow the glory of God to be over our loneliness, if we can allow the glory of God to come against our worst enemy, the glory of God to come at our biggest disappointment, the glory of God just into our life. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you it can overwhelm you in the most positive way to know that the majesty and glory of God, it's, listen, 
It's in you. If there's one thing we've said through the Gospel of John, it's helping us get to the place of understanding the Holy Spirit of God is in you. And, and greater is he who is in you than he who that is in the world. And think about all of those truths and you go, wait a minute, wait, I have the glory of God in me. In fact, Paul even describes it in the book of Corinth, one of the, uh, I think, 1 Corinthians, he talks about the glory of God. And he says, even as great as the glory of God was as Moses was up on the mountain, how much greater is the glory of God in us? The glory of God can speak into your circumstances. The glory of God can speak into your losses. The glory of God can speak into your worst pain and your biggest failure. That's one of the things you see right here is failure. And I'm telling you, as we, as we wrap this up in, in John 18, and then we're going to fast forward to John 21 as we finish, you're going to see how the glory of God just speaks to our failure. And it comes through the life of Peter. I love Peter. So um, we're going to fast forward this, pick up in verse 10 as this is happening. We're going to look at um, Peter today. Next week, we're going to look at what's happening in the life of Jesus in, in, in John 18 and John 19. So hang with me. We're not going to get to that today. We're just going to look at the life of Peter. So he says this, uh, John, who's writing this, is giving an account. He says, Simon Peter, verse 10, then having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath, the cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? This is Peter's first failure in the middle, of, in this. Peter's first failure, and it comes with him drawing a sword and cutting off someone's ear. And here's where um, we are so much like Peter. Because Peter, in this moment, he's trying to come to Jesus' rescue. It's like Jesus is about to be arrested by all of these people. And so he feels like, wait a minute, I'm going to come to his rescue. So he draws this. I don't know what he's thinking. I mean, there's only 11 of the disciples. And who knows how many others are out there with the torches and lanterns and swords we don't, and weapons. We don't know how many there are. But there's only 11 disciples. So even if every one of them has a sword, it's still 11 against untold number. I'm pretty sure that the disciples would lose the fight if they were to fight. But... The problem is, we do the same thing. We feel like in our life, we've got to come to rescue Jesus. We've got to come to rescue him from someone who's saying something against him, and we have to come to his defense. And I just want to tell you, you're getting it wrong. So many of you are trying to rescue Jesus, but you've not allowed Jesus to rescue you. And that's the difference. The difference is, Peter didn't realize Jesus needed to go to the cross for him. He didn't realize in that moment that Jesus needed to die on his behalf. He didn't realize just the magnitude of this moment as he reached for his sword and went to cut off the ear. He was trying to rescue Jesus and he lost sight of the fact that he is the one that needed to be rescued. And the way that that translates into our life is, is that we are the ones who are in need of being rescued. And listen, I know, I know where some of you are. I don't know where all of you are. I don't know what's happening in all of your lives, but I could probably guess. Because at the end of the day, every one of us in here has experienced some kind of failure. I mean, if you look around the room, there's nobody in here that's nailed it 100% of the time. Everybody in this room has made some decision at some point in our life that we wish we could take back. Everybody has done something at every point in our life that we wish we could go back and undo. And the truth is we can't. Some of you walk around and you've got your heads down and you feel like the wind's been taken out of your sails. And I just want to tell you today that Jesus wants to speak into your failure. He wants to use your failure. He wants to use it to continue to mold and shape you into the man or woman that he desires for you to be. So don't miss that. He's going to rescue and redeem you from every evil deed. That's what he tells us in Titus chapter 1. That he's going to rescue and redeem us from every evil deed if you will let him. So don't get it, don't get it wrong. Don't misunderstand this. Don't try to come to Jesus' rescue thinking you've got to come to his aid. He doesn't need you to. He's going to come to your aid. He's going to come to your 
rescue. And watch how this happens. So pick up verse 15. We're going to look at a little more of what's happening in the life of Peter. Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the, uh, to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Verse 17. Then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. The first denial. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there having made a charcoal fire. For it was cold and they were warming themselves and Peter was also with them standing and warming himself. Go to verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Now, I imagine in this moment, that Peter's expression was something like this. He heard what Jesus had said, that you will deny me three times. I'm sure Peter thought that he was stronger than that. I'm sure Peter thought, there's no way that I'm going to deny Jesus. I would never do that to you, Jesus. So I imagine that as that rooster crowed and these events are happening so quick that he realizes that that was the third time that he denied Jesus and I I imagine in this moment that the wind is completely out of the sails his sails and he can't believe that he did that he can't believe that he would fail Jesus that way and you see the reality of it is that happens for all of us in our lives we might have this great high moment with Jesus and we, we come back, maybe it's from a conference or we just come back from a great worship deal or whatever. And we come back and we think, I'm going to conquer the world for Jesus. And then when the first moment of adversity comes into our lives, we're running away. And we're failing, we're going, how? Why? I can't believe I did that. This happens to everybody in the room. Listen, I'm telling you, look around the room. Everybody has done this. Everybody has gotten to that place where they've said, I just can't believe I did that. I can't believe that I responded that way. I can't believe I just said that. I can't believe I acted on something that I thought. I can't, I can't believe, I can't believe, I can't believe that I would do such a thing. And the truth of it is we all do that. We all fail your world. All in that together. And it happens. There's, there's four, four things that happen when we do this. The first is this. Causes of spiritual failure. The first one is that we fail when we refuse to submit to the word of God. We fail when we, we, we refuse to submit to the word of God. And here's what I mean. Really getting to that place where we're looking at the word of God going, I want to walk in obedience. One of the reasons, next thing, the, that we don't do that is pride. Pride. It's, it, we, we choose to disobey because we get to different places and different moments in our life where we say, I know better than God does. I think I know a better way. Oh, he said that, but he didn't really mean it. Oh, he said that 2,000 years ago. He didn't really mean it today. But, and, and that's where we're stepping outside of submitting to the authority of God's word over our life. And we're walking in pride saying, I know better. And we, we need to check ourselves when it comes to that and go, wait, wait, wait. what is that? Because what happens when we begin to do that, um, it, it, what we would call this a slow leak versus a blowout. I don't know of very many people who've had a spiritual blowout. I know of a lot of people who've had a slow leak, meaning it slowly happened over time. They slowly stopped submitting to God's authority of their life. They slowly allowed pride to continue to creep into their life. They slowly did this. They slowly did that. They slowly walked away. It didn't happen in this huge spiritual blowout moment. It's kind of like a flat tire. I've had um, some, some problems with some of the tires in my car because I have a lot of nails around my house, and I like to drive everywhere around my house these days because I don't really have a yard. 
And so I can just drive anywhere. I'm hauling a trailer, doing this or that. I can drive all the way around the back of the house. And to the point where earlier this year, I had a nail that was stuck in my tire. And I knew that every four days, I needed to put air in the tire. Anybody ever been there? Like you're too cheap to just fix it. So you just, I, I'm okay. I can just put some air in it. I get a little farther down the road. I can come back, put some air in it. That's what, that's what I'm talking about. It's, it's a slow leak. It's the nail in the tire. Very few of us have probably ever experienced a blowout on the tire where we're driving down the road and it's just boom and the tire goes out. But most, some of us have experienced that slow leak. We got that nail. And these things are happening in us. We refuse to submit to the word of God. We allow pride in our life. Number three, we grow spiritually dull. And when we grow spiritually dull, then we move and we become distant from God. We grow spiritually dull and distant. Dullness. I had a friend when I was in college who talked, uh, he used this as a description that we're all God's tools. And God places us in his, his work shed, so to speak. And the question becomes, when he goes to reach for us, are we sharp and ready to be used by him, or are we dull? And see, years ago was desensitized to things, and therefore you are drifting farther from God. And one of the things that we know about God is if you seem distant from God, let's ask the question of who moved. Do you think God is playing some kind of spiritual hide-and-seek with you? He's not. He is in the same place. He is waiting for you to return. So if God seems distant, you're the one who's been drifting, and you need to come back to him. In fact, he is inviting you back to him. In fact, he is giving you some promises. He's saying, listen, if you will draw near to God, if you move towards me, I'm moving towards you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So don't become spiritually dull and distant. And then one of the other things that happens for us is that um, we, we walk in the flesh instead of the spirit. And I don't know if that's happened to you. It happened to me this week. I was in a conversation with someone and the flesh just took over and I responded in a way that I shouldn't have responded. I don't, has anybody ever done that? Would you just, just with me, just go ahead and raise your hand. It helps me feel better to know that I'm not alone in that. And we do that. We, we walk in the flesh and not in the spirit. And we respond in pride instead of humility. And instead of allowing Jesus to come to our rescue and Jesus to come to our defense, we feel like we've got to come to his. So move from where you are towards Jesus, not away from him. It would have been really easy for Peter in this moment to say, I'm done. I've failed. I've gone too far. I've sinned too greatly, and I'm done. But you know what? Even when we feel like we're at our low points, when we feel like we're at this place, don't run away. In your low points, in your low points and your failures, you need to run to Jesus, not from Jesus. And I'm telling you, listen, if, if you can get this, get to that place where no matter what happens to you in your life, that you determine that you're never going to run away from him. Just run to him. Doesn't, what, whatever you've done, how, however greatly you think you've sinned, Run to Jesus. Don't run away from him. Don't try to hide from him. Don't, don't think that there's, you've done something too great or the magnitude is too severe or the consequences. No, 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 no. Always run to Jesus. Run to him. In your low points, you need to run to Jesus, not from Jesus. And why is that? Because you can't let your end point or you can't let your low point become your end point. You know what I mean? You can't let, you get into this low place and you want to quit. You want to throw in the towel and say, I'm done. But here's the thing. Jesus isn't finished with you. You might think you're finished. You might think you've gone too far. You might think that you've denied Jesus three times and therefore there's no hope for you. But Jesus isn't finished. And I want you to turn to John chapter 21. So I want you to see the end of this, really, this picture. But here's, here's the deal. I don't want you to overcomplicate this. 
It's really easy to get to John chapter 21, and you're going to want to overcomplicate it, especially if you're a theologian and you like to study the original languages because there's different words for love that appear here. But listen, I'll just be real honest with you. I'm a simple person. And, and I want to have a simple faith, and I don't want to overcomplicate it because what I see in John chapter 21 is just Jesus going after someone who's failed. He's going after someone saying, I'm not finished with you. The work that I have for you is still in play. I'm not done with you. And so he approaches Peter, knowing that Peter, I'm sure Peter was so relieved that moment he realized that Jesus rose from the dead, but he still has this cloud hanging over his head. And in that cloud, Jesus is going, I want to speak into that right here. And in John 21, just listen to this exchange. Uh, verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he, he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all these things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, tend my sheep. And so to me, I, I read this, and here's the simplicity of it. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three. Four of you knew that. Three times. How many times did Jesus Ask Peter if he loved him. Three. I, I don't want to overcomplicate it. I, I don't want to read into it. I'm just looking at it going, three times. Three times Peter denied Jesus, and three times he's got that thing hanging over his head thinking that he had failed so miserably. And three times after the resurrection, Jesus comes to Peter and asks him three questions, the same question three times. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Why? Because he wants to speak into his failure. He wants Peter to know that he's not finished with him. The, 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 the low point is not the end point. Failure isn't final. And so many of us think it is. In fact, the, one of the biggest problems in churches today, and I say churches, not just our church, but one of the biggest problems in churches today is that when we see someone who has failed, we don't think there's any grace for them. And that's forcing people, it's causing people to run away from God instead of to Him. And if there's one thing that I'm learning in, right now just in my own life, it's the story of the prodigal son from Luke 15. And it's the, why this is so important to me is I want people to run to Jesus. He's the one to run to at those low points. Not, don't be afraid of him. Don't be scared of him. He's not going to judge you. He's not going to speak condemnation into your life. He's not going to look at you and go, oh, you just really should have never done that. He's not going to look at you and go, see, I told you so. That's not him. That's us. That's how we respond in the flesh. That's how people respond when they look at someone else who has failed because it makes them feel better about their own failures and own insecurities. But Jesus is speaking into your fear and he's going, no, no, no. Come on, it's okay. I'm not finished with you. I still have work for you to do. In fact, Peter, when he leaves here, he goes to this upper room. They're praying. They receive the Holy Spirit. He preaches this amazing message at the beginning of the book of Acts. And over 3,000 people come to faith in Jesus Christ. You want to see how God can turn your failure into triumph? Look at Peter. Because I'm telling you, he's not finished with you yet. So I don't care what you've done in your life. I don't care how far you think you've strayed, how, how great of a sin that you think you've committed. There's always room at the cross of Jesus Christ for you. So come back to him. Come back to him. And here's what I mean. Psalm chapter 40, if you turn there. Psalm 40. 
gives us this picture. That I, I really believe we so desperately need. Not, not just in our life. Like, I don't mean just desperately in your life, individual. I mean, this is something that we need to become part of just following Jesus. Beginning to understand what he wants to do, what he wants to accomplish in your life. Your failure is not the end point for you. Your failure just is, is one of those things that we've all experienced and we've all gone through. And he wants to speak into that. And so I want you just to listen to what the psalmist writes in Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction. Out of of the miry clay. And he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. In the very beginning of verse 4, how blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust. You see, when I look at this, I think about so many of us, these people who are in that pit of destruction, people who are stuck in the miry clay, people who are longing that surely there's something more, there's a better way, there's something different. And I want to tell you that Jesus wants to rescue you. He wants to lift you up out of the pit of destruction. He wants to rescue you from being entangled in the miry clay. And, that, and that's, not, that's not the end though. Then he wants to set your feet on a rock. And he wants to make your footsteps firm. So that, guess what? So that you grow stronger. So that you can stand stronger. So that your failures become farther and farther and farther apart. It won't, means, it won't mean that you never fail again. It just means that as you are walking and your footsteps are firm, you're not failing as often as you used to. You're not failing as extremely as you used to because you're walking with firm footsteps. But listen, here's the thing. Jesus is the one. He's the one who's going to lift you up out of that pit of destruction. He's the one who's going to set you free from being entangled in the miry clay. And he's the one who wants to set your feet on the rock. So what do you need to do? You got to run to him. You, you got to run to him. What, whatever it is that you're facing, what, whatever it is that you're going through in your life. Listen, I know some of you right now, you, you, you don't even have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You've been playing this religious game for a really long time. And I just want to tell you, come to the place where you are choosing to believe in and follow Jesus. And watch him radically change your life. Come to him. Some of you have wandered, you've drifted. Some of you have had kids who've wandered and drifted. Here's the thing, just come back. If you know of people who have wandered and drifted, stop speaking a message of condemnation and judgment. And extend grace. Embrace grace for yourself and extend grace to other people. And invite them to come back to this wonderful Savior who gave his life so that we can be lifted out of a pit of destruction so that we can be set free from a sin that so easily entangles us so that he can set our feet on the rock. I'm asking if you would to stand with me. I told you, I, I don't know what everybody in this room is facing or going through. I, I can make a pretty good guess because I, I think it's, Everybody in this room's going through something. He's got it. However far you think you've gone, come back. 
I'm going to invite our prayer team's going to come down front as we close our service. I'm going to pray over us, and I want to invite you that, you know, if you just need someone to pray with or talk with as we close our time, they're going to be down front, and they're here to, to serve you. They're here to help you. They're here to pray with you and pray over you. Whatever it is that you're facing, they're going to keep it in confidence. And they're just going to pray over your life. And for the rest of us, I just want to say, listen, run to Jesus. He's not going to speak a message of condemnation or judgment over you. He is going to extend grace and mercy and love. Because that's who he is, even in the midst of our failures. Let's pray. Father, we are so humbled that you have a plan. You're, we're so humbled that even when we completely mess up and blow it, that you're waiting. You're waiting patiently, longing for us to return, to come back. So, Lord, I pray for those in this room who feel like their failures, their end point. God, I pray that you'd speak hope into their circumstances. God, for those who are entangled in sin and the miry clay, Father, I pray that you'd speak victory over their sin. Set them free, God, as only you can do. Lord, we thank you that you're always, always there waiting to deliver and rescue us. You are a gracious and kind God. And I pray that as we go through our week this week, that we would show people, that we would extend your grace, extend your mercy, so that they will see you and fear you and trust you and come to know you the way that we have for your name, for your glory, for your honor. And it's in Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being here. Y'all have a great week. Still